Welcome to the TEFL Training Institute podcast, the bite-sized TEFL podcast for teachers, trainers, and managers. Welcome back to the TEFL Training Institute podcast. This episode, we have Professor David Crystal, linguist, writer, editor, lecturer, and broadcaster. In this episode, I asked David Crystal about standard English. Why does standard English exist? How is it changing? And what type of English or English is should teachers teach? So we talked about pronunciation and also the role that culture plays in language teaching. I hope you enjoy the interview. David Crystal, welcome to the podcast. Can you start off by telling us when did the idea of standard English first start? Is it something that also came into play in the 18th century along with things like prescriptive grammar and Samuel Johnson and the first dictionary, etc.? Or was it something that started earlier than that? Uh, One has to ask the question, you know, what is a standard for? And a standard is to guarantee intelligibility uh, amongst lots of people. Because as long as you, if you carry on writing in your regional dialect, uh, eventually you won't understand each other. And so the first signs of standard English come in the Middle Ages when England becomes a nation rather than a set of independent kingdoms. And there is a national civil service evolving and a national parliament and all these things. And English is becoming the language of the nation. And then it became essential to get rid of some of these variations and all sorts of influences caused the evolution of standard English. You know, the civil service scribes, for instance, individual authors like Chaucer, uh, the influence of the Bible, uh, many, many different variations. But the point is that between 1400 and 1800, standard English as we know it today evolves. By 1800, virtually everybody was writing. And this is the point, writing. Standard English is essentially a written form of English, not a spoken form. Even today, only a tiny proportion of the world's English language users speak standard English naturally at home as a first language. Most people learn standard English in school. Uh, And I'm talking not just about foreign language learners, I'm talking about native speakers as well. Only about four or five percent, maybe even that's an exaggeration, of people in England speak standard English as a natural home language. You know, most people speak uh, regional variations. Most people say, I ain't got this, and we ain't got no nothing, and things of that sort. You know, double negatives, all non-standard features, but that's how they normally speak. Then they go to school, and they learn that that's not correct, dear boy. You know, you have to have to say it this way, and you, you learn standard English. And that's very useful, uh, as long as you don't then get your local accent and dialect demeaned in the process, which, of course, used to be the case. So anyway, around about 1800, standard English in this sense of a universal, pretty unified form of writing had emerged thanks to Dr. Johnson with his dictionary, people like Lindley Murray and Bishop Louth with their grammars, people like John Walker with his pronunciation dictionary and so on and so forth. There's still a certain amount of variation, but on the whole, you you know, it's pretty standard. And then along comes Noel Webster, in America and messes everything up, you see, saying, you know, we we don't want that standard anymore. We want a different sort of standard for a new nation. And so he develops different standards for American English. Again, only about 5% of American English is different from British English, you know, in terms of spelling, punctuation, vocabulary, grammar, and so on. But it's a pretty significant 5% nonetheless. So suddenly there are two standards in the world, you know, British, American. And then that's the open the floodgates, doesn't it? Because any other country now who comes along and wants to use English, as soon as they adopt English, they immediately feel they need to adapt it to express the identity of their own milieu. And this is where non-standard comes into play, because what non-standard does is it expresses identity rather than intelligibility. If you and I are speaking our non-standard English to each other, we're not going to understand each other, but I'm proud of my non-standard English and you're proud of yours. And of course, the result could be chaos, but in many parts of the world, what happens is that the two varieties are so distinct that they don't mix each other up. 
So I use standard English on some occasions. I use non-standard English on other occasions. So presumably now then most people recognize that one version of English isn't necessarily superior to the other. It's just that they get used at different times and in different situations, I suppose. Yeah. In other words, it's a notion of appropriateness rather than a notion of correctness. You see, the 18th century notion was that only standard English was correct. Everything else was incorrect and rubbish and should never be used. And you'll be punished if you use it. These days, it's a notion of appropriateness, that standard English is appropriate for some kinds of functions, non-standard appropriate for other kinds of functions. And this is where it gets relevant to all countries. We're not just talking about British and American and Australian and, you know, the old colonial territories. We're talking about Chinese English and Japanese English and, and so on. You see, what is Chinese English for me? Uh, Chinese English is not somebody learning English from China and getting it wrong. No, it's somebody learning English from China who is now developing a good command of English, but using it to express Chinese concepts and Chinese culture in a way that I would not necessarily understand because I don't understand Chinese culture coming from outside it. And all over the world now, we, we see these new Englishes, as they're called, being very different from traditional standard British English and traditional standard American English. And what they're doing is they're allowing the expression of their local identity to become institutionalized in dictionaries and in novels, you see, and plays and poetry and grammars and things like this, so that we now have to respect the identity of whatever it might be, Indian English, Nigerian English, Chinese English, by which I mean English written by Chinese authors expressing a Chinese milieu, but with a competent command of English, so that one can't just say, hey, that's a mistake. You know, that is a genuine shared expression of some perception that's coming from China. So given all that then, I mean, it really kind of complicates the job of English language teachers, doesn't it? I mean, what's acceptable to teach and what is it acceptable to leave out? It, it, it's, it's a lot more difficult, I guess, than it used to be, isn't it? Oh, gosh, it does, doesn't it? I, I mean, the, the, it is a fact that, it, that English language teaching has become more difficult because of the evolution of English in this way. You know, it isn't a simple, oh, there's British and American English, as long as you know those two, you're home and dry. You know, that's not the case anymore. A everything I've said, mind you, is really only relevant for language comprehension, not so much for language production. I mean, after all, if, if you're used to teaching standard British English in received pronunciation, as many teachers are, and in any case, as many exam boards expect, and as a lot of materials reflect anyway, then fine, you know, carry on. Standard British English is a good thing, you know, RP is a good accent, etc., etc. But when it comes to listening comprehension and reading comprehension, if one restricts one's ability only to British English and RP, then you miss out, oh, heaven knows how many percent, but we're talking, you know, probably most of the English language around the world. How many people speak traditionally British English in an RP accent? We're talking about, what, a couple of percent of the world's population. It's a very useful accent still, no question about that, and standard British is still a very useful dialect. But nonetheless, from a comprehension point of view, how often are you going to encounter it in the street, in literature, and so on? Uh, only a minority of the time. So uh, it's an increasing gap, it seems to me, between production and comprehension when it comes to teaching. And that's me finished now, Ross, because now it's your problem to decide how to implement this, you know, in terms of syllabus design and at what point in the teaching process do you introduce these variations you know uh, that's you know i have the easy job here <laughs> well well that's a pity because that was actually my next question <laughs> so so do, what do you think i mean should teachers and course books and writers be trying to work in examples of non-standard english and non-standard accents from all around the world into their lessons and in their course books I mean, it seems that even, for example, like native speakers might even need help with their listening skills in developing an ear for accents from parts of the world that they're maybe traveling to that they haven't been before. And I mean, presumably the same is true for non-native speakers as well. Oh, absolutely. And, and these days there is no difference essentially between a native and a non-native speaker of English in this respect. I go to another part of the world just like a second language learner goes to the same part of the world, and we're both equally foxed 
by the local identity of the language. I have this all the time. I, I, I go to places, I don't know what the heck is going on because I just don't understand the local words, local expressions, the local uh, nicknames of the politicians, you, you know, all these cultural identity things are, are everywhere now and it's a problem for me as much as for the other. Now, as far as materials are concerned, well, yes, I, I think one should build in right from the very beginning an awareness of variation. Uh, some programs do this. Global, for example, uh, does this to a certain extent. But I think it's more general than that. All materials, of course, have always had a certain cultural input. You know, you teach the present tense by, for example, saying, let us go for a walk down Oxford Street and let's buy some things and we'll use the present tense for that. You know, this is grammar driving the, the content. But you could also at the same time let culture help to drive the content. So not only do you have a vocabulary list at the end of the chapter, which says what's going on, explains what's going on, but you have a culture list as well. For example, I went down Oxford Street and somebody says, uh, let's look at your watch. And, and you say, oh, it's a nice watch. Uh, and the person says, yes, but it's not actually Bond Street. It, it's Portobello Road. Now, you know, that's the kind of comment that anybody might make completely unintelligible to most foreigners until they know that Bond Street is the posh street and Portobello Road is a street market. So one could easy, you could easily imagine how, you know, going to a shop to buy a watch in order to drill the present tense or whatever um, might also be supplemented by a little cultural panel somewhere or other which says, here, this is a posh place to buy or this is not a posh place to buy. And you gradually build up a sense of the cultural identity of the place. Or put it another way, if I go to Beijing, how do you translate Bond Street and Portobello Road into Beijing or wherever? You know, how would you do it? And if you, as a, Chi if a Chinese person, said that sentence to me in English, go to this part of Beijing, I would not know what it meant until it was explained, which is what I mean by saying it's a very general issue, this one. I also wanted to ask you a bit about how new meanings come about, because obviously that's something that happens, I think, both in standard and in non-standard English. And I think you mentioned in A Little Book of Language about encouraging people to look up word meanings in dictionaries. But is it also the case that words often only really take on new meanings when people misuse them? Can you tell us a bit about how new meanings come about and maybe how at first they might be non-standard or maybe even just considered to be wrong? Well, to begin with, some people would say that a new, any new meaning was a wrong use, that there are always pedants around who will say that any change is an error uh, to begin with and then gradually usage grows and people forget that there was ever a problem and they focus on new things that are taking place, you know. This does routinely happen, but it's only happened since the 18th century. Before that, change just took place. People did object to it. Some people tried to stop it. You know, people like Dryden and Swift, and to begin with, Johnson said, we must stop language change. Uh, look, the French have done this with their academy. Uh, they've stopped because they haven't, but they tried and thought they were doing so. Johnson himself recognises this eventually and says, you know, even the French haven't managed to stop language change. That's why we don't want an academy over here. So change takes place. It will always get reactions. Uh, but it's a very natural, very natural process, a very subtle process. Most of the semantic changes that affect vocabulary take place without anybody noticing them happening at all until you know, they become established, they get in the dictionary, a new sense comes along. And people say, oh, yeah, of course, so, you know, we've been saying that for years, really. I just haven't noticed it happening. So one more time, everyone, that was Professor David Crystal. If you'd like to know more about David's work, please visit his website at www.davidcrystal.com. I hope you enjoyed today's interview and we'll see you again next time. Goodbye. videos and blogs, visit our website www.tefotraininginstitute.com. If you've got a question or a topic you'd like us to discuss, leave us a comment. And if you want to keep up to date with our latest content, add us on WeChat at Tefotraininginstitute. Training Institute. And if you enjoyed our podcast, please rate us on iTunes.